Here you can see where felling has taken place of an ancient woodland habitat. There's some regrowth coming through where stumps have been left. And there's a road here where there's been hard gravel put for forwarders and harvesters, where no planting can take place. There's a strong presumption against the removal of such habitats. Fragment the woodland habitat for biodiversity. Yeah, a, a completely restored ancient woodland site mm -hmm. in pristine condition. Instead, we've got just some regen coming through. And yet, it'll come through. And yet, nature will sort itself out and it will come back again. It's going to probably take another 10, 15 years. Good in the way of that, things like the ash trees and that that's on the way out would die back. Mm -hmm. It's got seed on them at times and, and that can you know, fall into the ground and maybe get a little bit of new um, ash coming, coming in here because we're not allowed to plant it, plant it now. Mm -hmm. um, so that might have some kind of resistance. Behind me you can see a clear felled operation where they've used the brash to reduce the impact on the soil the heavy machinery and there's some deadwood in relation to the stumps here. Leaving this as open ground or to extend the buffer of the ancient woodland site you can see behind me that goes along the riparian corridor. Some Norway spruce here that's been earmarked for thinning and a low impact silviculture system known as continuous cover forestry. With it being so close to the water, implications with siltation and acidification will have to be taken into account when felling operations begin. And also the 50% light, which is part of the 5 metre buffer zone, keeping in line with the UK forestry standards. UK forestry standards suggest to remove dense conifer plantations near rivers to allow for biodiversity. Conifer trees absorb pollutants from the atmosphere which are acidic and can be washed into adjacent watercourses following the downpour. But complete removal of this stand could cause implications in water catchment and subsequent siltation. This is a previously long term retention site that was blown down by Storm Arwen. You can see where the timber haulage team really compacted the soil down there. This is a treasured site, there's a path leading through here. But they're still deciding what to do with this area. But with it being so close to the river, it's probably good to keep it in a, to extend the buffer zone. I think there's talk of it making it a wetland. Pass here are used both by the public who follow the outdoor access code, use the paths for cycling, walking and horse riding. It's also used for timber access and timber haulage. You can see some agricultural fields here and a sign keeping dogs safe from disturbing the livestock. showcasing the multi-functional aspect of a forest here. With a forest being part of the Seven Stains mountain biking trail down in the southwest of Scotland, there's some world-class cycling trails incorporated in, in the forest. This is important for tourism, where people from all over the UK visit the site to experience the world-class trails we've got established here. They're still being built. clearly signposts to warn people to keep within their ability level Good for with that us. local community. It's a treasured part of a forest. It helps people get in a healthy lifestyle, improving their health and well-being. It's a great open area with varied stand heights. The open area will help to wind firm the stand edges, but it's also good for um, habitat, um, for mainly black grouse. Um, so there's some wind thrown trees, even in the wind firm edges, there's still evidence of 
um, wind damage. You can see it up here as well. So probably like a diversified um, tree species is probably best in the diversified height where thinning can actually help in these situations. The open area here, um, after being clear felled, was probably left to fallow, maybe for five years. But the um, felling licenses um, suggest that he needs to be restocked immediately. Um, sequester carbon. Um, so whether they um, asked for a felling license to be um, extended or something like that. Here you can see a depiction of the wind farm edges, the varying tree heights as it progresses through the forest. And you can see some plantation here beyond that, the wind farm edge. And there's like a five year rotation, so that should, within five years that should be protecting the far away stand, which can be then felled. And then the process happens. We should probably be thinking about diversifying our species base anyway, because that's good forestry. Really. Yeah. And then it kind of gets to the point where if you haven't thinned something for so long, yeah. you may as well just leave it because thinning it now will make it throw yeah. more stuff in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, a technical paper written in 1996 suggests designing forest edges to improve wind stability, where topping or high pruning can offer short term protection after clear felling or tapered or graduated density of forest edges can offer longer term protection. New evidence suggests that a combination of continuous cover forestry practices, such as a diverse height and diverse species, can produce a more resilient stand than a dense, unthinned stand, which may be implemented in subsequent rotations. Here you can see some really thick re natural regeneration of Sitka spruce. It can be left to naturally thin unless there's stagnation, but it'll need to be uh, monitored. Um, otherwise, thinning operations will have to go on. It's quite an operation. Um, we'll scarify tracks to allow for operational access after it becomes mature and uh, do a natural selection from that but it'll probably be taken in a couple of uh, sections in a five year rotation. Um, it's good for wind resistance. Um, natural regeneration also reduces the need for harmful pesticides like acetanaprid for the control of pine weevil and the need for the soil cultivation when compared with planting, reducing net discounted revenues. Behind me you can see some lovely acid rough grass, which is one of the habitats required by the lichen the black grouse. So with it being beside the ancient woodland site, across the road here, some dwarf heath and this makes for a perfect mosaic habitat for black grouse. Lake and grouse require moorland habitat as a breeding ground and to connect areas for a genetic exchange as a decline in grouse is re correlated to intense land use and fragmentation of habitat between populations leading to the possible local extinction. Dwarf shrub is good for adults feeding also possesses some invertebrates that the young might feed off of. Open areas of acid rough grass like this are important for breeding grounds for black grouse. You can see at the back a real mosaic habitat. <laughs> 